Uh, and just to be clear, this is my show, which means no questions are off limits. So, <laughs> all right. Welcome to Open Susa 101. Yeah. So that's Brian, and I'm James. Uh, um, James is a community member, does all sorts of cool stuff, runs, <laughs> makes the booth here happen every year. Uh, I'm on the board of directors, which means I, I do nothing. I do absolutely nothing, but I'm an elected to do nothing, so that's me. <laughs> Coincidentally, we also both work for Susan, but that's coincidental. Total coincidental. <laughs> okay. Um, really? <laughs> okay, so most people, when they think of Open Sousa, they think about this, right? You think about our distributions. You know, probably, how many of you have run Open Sousa show of light sticks? Nice. Nice? It's not bad. How many of you have run Leap? Okay, that's cool. How about Tumbleweed? Oh, you guys are hardcore. That's awesome. Yeah, Tumbleweed's my jam. Okay, but. We try really hard to say that this isn't actually what OpenSUSE is about. Mouse, go away. Um, hey, it works now. We're about the community, and OpenSUSE is a community at heart. Um, the distro is the thing that ends up coming out of our community. It's the high-profile so, thing. Yeah. And I mean, we're we, a fun community. We're a loving community. That's why it's the heart. <laughs> we love you guys. It's awesome. Just um, out of curiosity, James, what is our community slogan? What's our motto? Have a lot of fun. Have a lot of fun. Yeah. That's literally the community <laughs> motto for a technology project building an operating system. <laughs> Take that for what it is. I like it. <laughs> so how do we get things done? Because a community of Linux people is like a herd of cats, right? Yeah. So, well, we, uh, we as the community officially, we have members. You can join the community. You have to... Uh, there's a membership form somewhere on OpenSUSE's site. Somewhere on there. Somewhere yeah. it's a site, but membership. And a member needs to show that they made some substantial contribution. That could be a lot of things. I think when I became a member seven years ago, it was... <laughs> really? <laughs> Thanks, Gnome. <laughs> um, it was for helping out at the booth here and doing yeah. some wiki stuff. So it doesn't take a lot, but like you have to show some commitment. And some board member... Some board Some member, board member. Yeah. needs to say yes. Yes. So now is actually a really good time if you want to be a member. Yeah, now, now is a really good time. Yeah, because I had no standards whatsoever, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, the job of the membership as a core is to make the board. Um, and the board is, unfortunately, people like Brian this year. Yeah. Because we've learned that elections can be easily manipulated. <laughs> <laughs> so in case, in case you were wondering, like, how it works. So the, the board is a very small organization. Um, there is one person that's the chairman of the board. That is the one... <laughs> that's not yet? No. Okay. That's not yet. <laughs> I'll talk to you about that later. <laughs> so... <laughs> There's the board. I know. The board is elected from the community. The board normally does a two-year term, and the board handles all the stuff that the community can't handle on its own. They handle sticky stuff about trademarks and reuse and answering questions and dealing with arguments, but fundamentally, it's the community that makes the decisions about how open source products and tools are built. Um, it truly is a meritocracy in that those people who do it do. Um, if you don't like the way something works on Yast and you make a pull request, and it gets merged in, then you just change the behavior of Yast in the next version of Tumbleweed. Yeah. It's literally that straightforward. And it doesn't matter if I don't like it, because <laughs> no one <laughs> listens to me anyway. Yeah. Like, literally, it's, it's not even a meritocracy. It's like, yeah, it's the inmates running the asylum okay. at all times. It's fantastic. Except for a few special things. Yeah, very yeah. special. And on the board is the chairman. A chairperson. The chairperson. He's a man. A chairperson. <laughs> Richard Brown is our chair. Is our chairperson. Um, we don't know if he's a man or a woman. Apparently. Um, yeah. So that's the that's an appointed position from the primary sponsor of Open Sousa, which is the Sousa Corporation. He is and Sousa he, right now? He he is yeah. Sousa, and so he kind of acts as like the liaison between Open Sousa and Sousa. It's almost like he's a bridge between Open Sousa and Sousa. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> I should get you to do all my slides. <laughs> it's great. Except there's always a hiccup at the beginning. That's fine. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, uh, the chairperson is appointed by the largest sponsor of the project financially, so there is an incentive there. But it actually isn't written in the bylaws that that is Sousa in particular. It just happens to have coincidentally been Sousa. Yes, Do you Adam. have a question, Fedora? Is the chairperson the overridden by anyone, or does he have, like, ultimate veto? The and chairman has one vote on the, the board. Yeah, the, the chair, the chairman, it doesn't really have any more power than like I have, which is scary. <laughs> um, he really is. It's like a, it's like a regular position, but with a little bit more of the organizational responsibilities, just a little more work. And he's like the liaison. So like if our main sponsor, uh, like in Sousa's case, the main is the main sponsor, but they also help us with like server space, right? right. So he's responsible for taking all of our complaints and frustrations and making them nice and packaging them and working with the people mm -hmm. that are sponsor. Like, that's his job. Yep. Is there a thing so that the primary sponsor, like, always has a majority on the board? Or is no, no. So, no. And in fact, fact, only two positions on the board okay. besides the chairman of the five can be from any company. From any, okay, so no so, one company can have... A monopoly of the board. So, like, like I'm on the board this year with one other Sousa employee, which means James can't, I can't run. run. He can't even run. Like, theoretically, he could run, but even if he won, he can't be in. Like, he can't come in the cool clothes. But yeah. <laughs> I'm out. And is the chairperson counted in the two? No. Uh, the chairperson is separate. Chairperson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, the, yeah. the chairperson is separate. Because they're not. But, no, but yeah, but even yeah, even that. So it's it's six total people. And then, so it's three total so from any one company, including happen. whoever the chairperson is. Yes. yes. Never can be more than 50%. And if there's a 50% deadlock, then we just, like, thunderdome it. We just cage back <laughs> right. until one person dies. <laughs> and then there's, yeah. And then it helps it's the back to five votes. You know what the horrible thing is? I'm pretty sure there actually is a system in place for when there's a, <laughs> it's like a thing like that. But I don't know what it is, so I just make it up. <laughs> so... It, one of the other things that the chairperson has to do is try to coordinate the way these teams work together because there are there's a lot of overlap, obviously, between people and engineers who work at SUSE and the community um, around OpenSUSE. And so we, he has to take care of shepherding that relationship, not just at a technical level and a thing level, but also at, in a community space and make yep. sure that the things that SUSE employees contribute work in the OpenSUSE community space. Um, to that end, Richard in particular has pushed really hard to move SUSE into a factory contribution model. Um, the way SUSE Linux Enterprise used to be built in the, you know, up until, the, you know, the SLES 11 days was that the SUSE engineers would take <coughs> an open SUSE version and fork it and then begin to build the SLES version out of it. Yeah. Um, SLES 12 was based on open SUSE 13.1 um, in particular, yeah. which made all kinds of problems when we wanted to go to leap. Um, Richard puts really aggressively to get the developers to stop doing that and instead put their fixes back into factory um, immediately. So instead of hardening SLES, we were automatically hardening factory, which is tumbleweed, which trickles down. Now, on the other side of that, we do the upstream contribution model. And this is why you don't see as much SUSE software in the distro as you would on maybe some other distros. This is less true than when I planned this speech two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But our, our intent is for everything we do to go upstream, into upstream projects. YAST came long before this. In defense of YAST in particular, um, YAST, YAST was built in its own programming language, YCP, a long time ago, right? Two years ago, YAST was ported to Ruby. Okay? Everything on YAST was put on GitHub. Yep. All the modules were broken out, and now the team has been working on breaking out parts. So we've got a really awesome Ruby library for dealing with config files that can handle conflicts and other sources and different things managing config files. And it's a and it's a completely standalone library that has nothing to do with YAST. Did you say config? Config files. Config. Yeah. Config. 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 <laughs> can we get a vote on this? Con config. Raise your hand. Config. Right Down. Here. Config. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> it is now officially config files. <laughs> you can keep your config files next to your tomatoes. <laughs> All right. Done. So, where were we? Oh, we're talking about the community. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the community isn't just engineers. We do other stuff. We go to events, right? And so we have events.opensystem.org. <laughs> and we organize some of our own events, but we also attend other events like Linux Fest. And so this is something that our community does internally. 
Um, I'm not on paid time right now. You are, but that's just because you just, whatever. <laughs> I cheated. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here because this is part of my responsibility to the community to these events. But even on this, right, we are a group of engineers, so we have our own event managing software called Awesome. And that's the awesome possum. <laughs> right? So, yeah, really? So, if that's not enough to get you to do something. Is there, is there it's the awesome possum. And actually, awesome is being used now, not just for our conferences, it's being used by GNOME yep. for Guadec. It's being used by KDE for Academy. Wait, wait, wait. GNOME or GNOME? <laughs> GNOME? Whatever you say, Brian. I, oh, I'm going to lose on this one. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> I think I just lost that one big time. Uh, recently, uh, Postgres US used it for PGConf. Um, and, it's nice. And the OpenSUSE conferences, <laughs> obviously. So uh, that's another thing we do at our community. And then we can start getting into the meat of this, yeah. stuff, right? The build service. Build service is How awesome. How many of you guys have an account on the build service? How many of you guys went by the booth and got your OBS t-shirts? Sweet. Uh, how many of you are going to go after this talk and get your OBS? Yeah. <laughs> Not all of you. <laughs> it wasn't that big a box. Yeah. Um, so the Open Build Service is a project that, that OpenSUSE has been working on for a long time. This used to be the OpenSUSE Build Service, and we fractured it out um, because we wanted it to be more open and available to other services. Um, OBS lets you take your source code and package it. This is how we end up building our distributions and how we build all the packages for our distributions. It's not just for OpenSUSE. Um, we also build packages for Ubuntu. We build packages for Red Hat. We Arch. build packages for CentOS. We build packages for Arch and Magia. Magia, um, yep. There's, a, there, there's always... There's <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say flat out, nobody knows. Nobody knows how to say that. We build SIGWIN packages. Do we build SIGWIN packages? Yeah, we do. We build tons of SIGWIN packages. Oh. Uh, there's some other distro we build for, but I forget. what we do. <laughs> <laughs> I forget what it's called. Anyway. Um, so it's not just... What was that? You cool. Yes. <laughs> what do you got, man? Um, so you said you build uh, packages for SIGWIN? Yes. Um, where can I find more information? Document. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if there's a lot of docs on Sigwin because that's like dark magic. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, sort of my experience. but if you look up any Sigwin package on OBS, you're going to find the spec and the source and the patching and how it's done. That and is then probably the best way. That's probably yeah. the best way to go is to just copy one that already exists and then change it. Yeah. Yeah, just, just pick a really simple package and then just tweak it yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I do. So that's a great way to build packages. But and not only does it build packages, but you can it, it'll build them and then provide you with a little repository for them. Yeah. So it's really slick. So if you want to package your own piece of software, like if this guy, this beautiful Fedora-loving man here, wants to build an application that's like, nothing but a picture of a talking hot dog. Um, <laughs> he could build that, put it in an open build service, and literally package it for every single platform that's supported, which is most of the main Linux platforms. Uh, he and could build beefy miracle yes. dot, beefy miracle dash, power PC le yes. dot deb. Yes. In or OBS. <laughs> and then, right, but that, that's just it, is if you're, if you're trying to build for... If you are an independent software vendor, you want to hit for as many as possible. And if you do it that way, once you've got like your spec files and everything like that all set into open build service, you can then just re-upload your code, re-grab it, and have it automatically build for all of those platforms. You can use that repository link for everyone else and say, hey, everyone, go get the code, go get the project from that repository link, and it's all automatically updated. It's just, it's just such a sexy way to do it. And those platforms <laughs> aren't just the distros. As I mentioned, it's also architectures. So x86, 64, 32-bit, ARM, 6, 7. Yes, yeah, so if you um, want to build for Raspberry Pi, you can Power do that. PC, Power PC LE. It's awesome. Um, and I think we are using Kimu now to even do Super H. I didn't know so, that either. Yeah. 
awesome. Because if there isn't a machine available, it'll just use Kimu to emulate it. That's right. So, yeah. So you can build all the things. You have a question, man. Can it do app image? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> But I mean, that's just it. Is you look at this, and I mean, it is a it's a community project. It's not driven by like a corporation. It's it's the community is just coming together, building this. And clearly, the design is such that we want it to hit as many targets as humanly possible. So I don't think there's anyone on the Open Build Service project and team that's like, no, let's not do these package formats and platforms. Like we just yeah, everything great. Let's package it. Let's go. And as an open source project, it's used by a lot of other platforms as well. Yep. Intel runs it in t internally. Dell, HP. Yeah. Um, I don't know who else off the top of my head. I don't know. Red shirt, nice man. List. So when are you going to take over Microsoft and make it better? Yeah, please. <laughs> we're still, we're still, we're still, we're still, we're still we bigger, bigger than us. Yeah, it's there's so we 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 bit bigger. Although we do keep buying companies that are larger. Next project, <laughs> I think, really is is getting both Ubuntu and Fedora to start building all of their projects inside of Open Build Service. I think that's the next logical step here. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's great for packages, but what about when you want to build a whole distro? Yeah. Right? And this comes in. How many of you are familiar with Kiwi? A few. Yeah, that's about what I thought. How many of you have used SUSE Studio? <coughs> Kiwi is what made that happen. Um, Kiwi is uh, probably the most awesome, least well-known piece of software ever. Um, you know... Uh, if you want to name respins for Ubuntu, you think of like Kubuntu, Zubuntu, which yeah. you're just putting it on the desktop. You think of things like uh, that are going a little farther, like elementary, you know, where they're actually taking that a little bit farther. But you know, you could probably name on both hands all the Ubuntu respins that you can think of. There's 15,000 OpenSUSE respins in SUSE Studio. 15,000. So you don't hear about them a lot because there's so many that are niche for everybody's one thing. Yeah. Because you can build your own distro, and you can build your own distro, and you can build your own distro, and you can build your own distro. You cannot build your own distro. <laughs> <laughs> but you can get darn, darn close. <laughs> so, well, so, KDE Neon, right? Does anybody remember KDE Neon? Is anybody using KDE Neon? That guy, right? Okay. So do you want to explain KDE Neon, or do you want me to... Tell me if I get it right or wrong. KDE. Okay, so KDE Neon was an effort to build for KDE to build their own distribution based on the trunk of KDE. Um, which right. and then there was a whole political kerfuffle because that, is this the KDE distribution? So the the, the, the idea was that there was a single distribution that would be the quickest way for KDE users and developers to be able to get the latest versions of KDE in their hands to use it. Right away. As soon as that sucker comes out of the build, it's boom, it's right there. Uh, which, yeah. Um, seven days before the first KDE Neon image hit any server where you could actually download it, Richard Brown had built KDE, or OpenSUSE Argon, and Argon, and... Uh, the there was one other gas. noble gas that we yeah. used. I don't remember Xenon. what it was. Xenon. Xenon, yeah, yeah. Which were Leap and Tumbleweed with Trunk KDE. Yeah. Because it literally took two different lines in in a Kiwi build to make it use the trunk packages instead of the stable packages, and that was done. Right, so, so all the work that the KDE team did to bring KDE Neon about... They Somebody still did end in up, an hour. They did an annoyance. hour on OpenSUSE <laughs> just to be because they were annoyed at the gall of KDE's approach to it, uh, and we still consistently have the latest versions of KDE available for us before KDE Neon. Consistently. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and well, yeah, I think I think we've got a thing on that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll get to that. But yes, yeah, and it, it I is want to let Adam get comfortable before we bring up OpenQA. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Kiwi. An XML file, a tarball, and out comes an ISO, a raw disk image, an AMI, a VHD, a fixed image, fixed size VHD for Azure, it's like eight, right? uh, VMDK, an OVF, an OVA, a Docker file, a nested Docker file. Uh, <laughs> this is true. A pre-install ISO, it's which ridiculous. is just a one-click install. Um, I think that's it. Maybe there's more. Is that it? I think that's it. Is that all of them? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's ridiculous, man. So, yes. But this is this is just Susie based. It's sisters. You it, could do anything. You with could. It. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Ooh, I mean, we we could. use Open Susie base for the base, but yeah, I yeah. mean, theoretically, I mean, there's nothing there's nothing stopping someone from coming in and saying, I'm gonna. I'm going to use Kiwi with like a Debian type. Actually, in particular, it has formal support for CentOS and Debian. Does it have support for yes. CentOS? Yeah. That's rad. <laughs> We're awesome. You can build CentOS for <laughs> yeah. Kiwi. Huh. Meaner. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, you built your distro, right? We have our community, we have our engineers. They've put stuff upstream, they've made the Kiwi configuration, but we, we need to configure it. And again, this is our buddy. That's Yasty, by the way. He's an art mark. Because he just, he used to suck, but now he's just awesome. That's your take on art marks? Yeah. Yeah. He used to suck. Yeah, that's our take on art marks. <laughs> so he's the logo for Yast. Yast is the setup tool. Yes, Yast is like the one project that is persistently only in um, SUSE and OpenSUSE projects. Yeah. Um, not for lack of trying to get it other places. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to say about Yast. <laughs> you have nothing to say about Yast at all. I don't really no, use Yast. Yast is Yast awesome, is cool. but I don't really it use it. along really quickly. I'm it's a command line dude. I don't know. The dev has come along really fast since they've moved everything over to a programming language that more than three people know. <laughs> um, that's been good. We did mention that, right? Yeah. Yeah, Yast used to be built in its own programming language. It's not anymore, so it's better. <laughs> So I know just this last week they released support for Trusted Boot with the TPM modules, which is cool. Interesting. Okay. I don't, does Fedora handle Trusted Boot through TPM? You have to ask Matthew Garrett. Uh, the guy who you don't know? Stuff. I don't want to ask Matthew Garrett. He's going to lecture me about something. <laughs> <laughs> that's the trade-off. Yeah, 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 that's the trade-off. <laughs> so we built I our package in OBS. We channeled, bundled it through some Kiwi. We added a little Yast. And the last thing we need to do is test it and make sure it works. So we have OpenQA. Oh, look, even the Fedora guy likes OpenQA. <laughs> well, I'm the OpenQA maintainer for Fedora. I run it right now. I know. Yeah, it's Open so QA's good bad. for testing distros that even other distros use it. Yeah. So Open, <laughs> OpenQA really is, at its simplest core, just a gigantically awesome automation framework for, for visually automating test suites. It's and we also use like it. the heaviest weight, most frightening way I've ever seen to run a test ever. Yeah, it's it's pretty intense. But the, the really cool part is the way we kind of integrate this. And, and it's, it's it's a totally kind of cool approach. So like Tumbleweed, right? <laughs> OpenSUSE Tumbleweed is a rolling distro, which means we're cranking out packages like, like gangbusters. We're just shoving them out into the world. But unlike some rolling releases, we want to make sure before we push packages out, they're fully tested. And we don't have a million monkeys to sit there pounding and testing on every random update to Firefox that gets shoved out there. So what we do is we have a huge number of test suites in OpenQA to do everything from testing just booting up and clicking on a thing and typing some commands and installing Firefox and launching it, moving a window around, you know, just like simple things and sometimes more complex things. But then we've got these big suites we can run and we're like, okay, so as of today is Tuesday, we've got a whole bunch of new packages coming in. Let's shove them out to the world really fast for Tumbleweed. But tonight, let's run the whole test suite under OpenQA and make sure it doesn't make everyone's computers explode in a horrible, fiery napalm death before it goes public. Yeah. It's very, very delightful. So in that way, it's like a rolling release, except it's actually tested and usable and won't destroy everything. Yes. How long is the test take to run? Seven million years. Actually, no, uh, it's it's actually not too bad. I'm, no, it's like... It's not bad. Yeah. It doesn't take... It doesn't even take days. I mean, There's a reason why we can only do seven versions of Tumbleweed a week. <laughs> seven <laughs> versions a week. Yeah. I mean, we're, I think so... The, I think the full test suite is like eight hours. Right, but it's, it's it a twice. lot of tests. Do you know... I mean, I don't remember exactly how many it is, but it's a lot that we're running, yeah. so... Yeah, every, it, every it, stage of Yast... If we had to Every do it by desktop. hand, it would take a QA team a whole month to do it, okay. and we do it in a night. And as we've kind of streamlined the loop of doing that in a continuous cycle, we're getting more and more tests come up. Yeah. Um, it's obscenely heavyweight because it's not, it's not specific to anything. 
um, in its native behavior, it's running Kimu virtualization to boot up a machine. So it starts with an ISO and installs the distro. Or you could, run it, you gotta, you or you could run it on hardware, yeah. or you could you run it in the Docker container, but whatever, that's that's and, and actually, it's actually simulating so, mouse clicks and yep. simulating keyboard presses. I mean, it's and not... comparing full screens. It's not just like so. running a script to install something. It's literally simulating the experience of someone going, sitting down and going... Zip or install, like, like so doing it all. Um, Change in the screen. Yeah, yeah, screen differences, basically. Yeah, we look at, we look at areas of screen for specific well, content, and there's then if there's, yeah. a, some, there's a hash that's performed against the screen on that area to look for a differential. That's interesting. Yeah. Where so it works commands, there's a more robust way of doing yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, for graphical stuff, we do it like that. I mean, it's so, so yeah, it basically lets us, you know, go through. We, if, and it's great. It'll screenshot all the problems. So we're like, okay, five big errors came up, and, well, let's just go in and just look at what those errors look like. So sometimes we need to sit down and, you know, reproduce them a whole bunch of different ways. But sometimes we just look at them and go, oh, yeah, look, I did not install the theme. The theme's all dorked up. I know what I did wrong. Yeah, it's, sometimes it's just as easy as that. Yep. Um, Yes. Well, there's it's a percentage. Never update fonts is the, is the moral of the story. <laughs> no, I mean, when we changed our font, it was, it, was a, it was a pretty small expected change, and it was just a matter of selecting all the tests. And saying, it still okay, can be Those better. are good now. It's just, yeah, it, it just takes a little bit. You just have to re update so, screenshots. So, how does that deal with our distros for Leap? <coughs> Obviously, you've seen a lot of QA in that cycle. Um, and for Leap, you're seeing now that we have both the manual QA coming over from the SUSE side in addition to the automated QA from OpenQA. And so we're getting this really rock-solid, stable distro um, that's going to be with us for a long time and satisfy all the people that just want it to work and don't want it to change. So yeah. that's Leap. That's, that's Leap. That's Leap. And for those of you who haven't been uh, paying attention, we just changed the version numbering. So Leap uh, was version 42 um, and is now going to be version 15 because we like to mess with people. We just leaped a different direction. We just leaped a different direction. We just leapt backwards by 20 it's however many. It's not backwards. Many. It's just a different direction. Which way is backwards on the compass? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> South! But yeah, yeah. So, so basically we end up having, in the end, two very different but oddly similar distributions where one is just constantly rolling and constantly updated, and then there's Leap, which is just rock iron, just hard. Well, this was the eventual consequence of a lot of community work. The part of the community saying, I want it to go on my computer, I want it to stay on my computer, I want it to work, I don't want it to ever break. Yep. And then other people who say, <laughs> the hell with it. <laughs> I want the newest everything all the time, every day. Yep. Right? And um, we, we really wanted to do both. The, the factory development model allowed us to do that, and upstreaming things out to the communities, to the other packaging communities, allowed us to do that as well. So we ended up with Leap, which everything up to roughly X, as of 42.2, everything up to roughly X is binary compatible with SUSE Linux Enterprise. Yeah. You're running an enterprise grade kernel, you're running an enterprise grade lib, CS, lib SSL, and um, when there's an embargoed security fix, that we at Susan know about beforehand. The patch goes out to our customers. It's on OBS in the update repo the same day. Yeah. It's, it really is kind of a nice like combination of the two. So my personal laptop, I have open Susan Tumbleweed because I want all the latest and greatest on my personal laptop. I want to play with the new GNOME, or GNOME, sorry, uh, <laughs> just right away. Whereas on my production... I'm okay with either one, Brian. I, I am too. I just got However yelled, I got yelled at by the GNOME people a lot, so I <laughs> eventually started pronouncing it their way. Um, but like my video production machine, I don't ever want to change it because I'm afraid it's going to explode. So I use Leap, but I still need like one or two kind of newer packages. And so then I turn over to the open build service, and then those packages are up to date in the open build service, which, you know, tend to feed into, you know, Tumbleweed and everything else. And I can still install those on a one-by-one -one basis, grab the repositories for just the one or two applications that I need to have up to date on my Leap machine. And then I have a rock-stable build system that I can use for everything and just a couple of things that are constantly up to date and rolling, basically. So it's a nice, it's a nice combo.
the other side of that, where we're really exercising OBS is Tumbleweed. I mean, um, OpenQA. So Tumbleweed is our rolling release. Um, this came out of an old project from Greg KH, but we've had to kind of reinvent the way it works. And uh, Tumbleweed takes every stable release from one of the upstream development projects and integrates it. And the way we're doing that with QA is that we have a group of staging areas. And they're like little channels, staging A through G. And when KDE does a new stable release, even the smallest point release, it goes into staging, it's merged, we build an ISO, we run it through OpenQA. It passes or it fails. If it fails, it goes back to the dev team to fix their shit. Um, stuff. Stuff. Thanks. Yes. It's okay. I think we can swear. Okay. Um, if it passes, then it gets merged into the upstream factory project, and that goes through OpenQA again before it gets released as a version of Tumbleweed. Yeah. And then we cycle through to the next stage and the next stage. And so this is why we see a Tumbleweed version as frequently as every day, usually five to six a week. And like like latest versions of GNOME, like the current version hit Tumbleweed right away, and it took Arch a whole extra month. So even though we're extremely heavily tested, we get there faster. Somebody has a question. Um, it's kind of inside baseball stuff, but if you say you're you're running, a, I guess, a subset of OpenQA tests on every commit to the package repository, or no, when when the when when the develop project is ready for a release, they'll push it to staging. Uh, okay. And this so change on staging stage. triggers a build. How long does it take you to get an ISO out of the build system? Not long. Yeah, I don't know, I don't have exact stats on that, but it's pretty fast. Yeah, not long. So it's not, say, three hours? No. Interesting. No. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, it's, no, it's, it's... Inside baseball's fun. Well, <laughs> if, if all the build machines are busy, and you're waiting. Yeah, but, but I mean, like, but the, the, no, the actual build. I was, yeah, it should be I was building. I've been building AMIs this week, and it's been taking in the order of 200 seconds to get an AMI out. Well, yeah, okay. So three minutes, should three and a half minutes. Yeah. Should be. Yeah. CV's not much more. The only ones that are really, really take a lot longer are Azure images <laughs> yeah. because they want a 30 gig image. And so we have to build 30 gigs and then XZ compress it, which is single threaded, and that just takes eons. Yeah, and we, yes. we do add, you know, if you were doing anything with Fedora, there is like a, like a five minute sleep delay after every activity. So it does slow things happen. Yes? I, I used to work for a uh, major media company, and uh, one of the things that the operations staff prided itself on was the continuous uptime of our servers. We had one server that had been up for 946 days, and we had to move it one day. So we picked up the UPS that it was plugged into and moved the server with its UPS still up. We ended up disconnected from the network from one rack to another, and we almost made it when someone pulled the power cord a little too much. That was that. But, um, I admire your dedication. <laughs> <laughs> That's hardcore. This course. machine had, had gotten uh, software updates, except for the kernel. Uh, and I want to, and, and it's really great that you can turn things around quickly, but for someone in the uh, commercial web serving space, what they're really looking for is stability. Yeah. Because software maintenance is an entropy increasing. Um, yeah. Activity. Uh, I don't know how many times I've done an upgrade and it broke something. Especially in, well, I don't want to name names, but they're headquartered in Redmond. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's really why, I mean, if you're running Tumbleweed on a production server, you're doing it wrong. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's my, a general my, rule. My, my general thoughts are yeah, Tumbleweed is not, it's great that I get everything super wicked fast. It makes for a great development machine. But my, my recommendations to people, if you want something that's rock hard, iron, you go Leap. Because Leap is sharing the same kernel and everything else as Susan Linux Enterprise. It's, I mean, it's battle ready at that point. And, and if you do need, like I said, like other up-to-date packages, you go OBS, you get a couple of your key packages that you need for your server, and you're, and you're good to go. I, but if you're doing enterprise-grade stuff, if you 
need 900 days of uptime, a, a, a rolling release, any rolling release, it's just a bad idea. It's an interesting problem for automated testing because you want to test the thing fast and decide whether it works, but you can't do a seven day uptime test in less than seven days. So right? Yeah. You, you, you can't, you can't just speed up the process. clock right, somehow. Yeah. Turns yeah. out that they don't like it when you do that. Yeah, no, they get freaked out. All those leap you seconds. When you like... stop messing around with space time. Yeah. <laughs> Damn space time. <laughs> you can't just decide that the next hundred seconds are all leap seconds. <laughs> it just <this> doesn't work. <laughs> so. So those are our two distros that end up coming out, and our new tagline that these are the maker's choice. Um, so if you find yourself in one of those categories, I'd really like to encourage you to join our community, try out our end products, see where you fit in between, and um, that's OpenSUSE 101. And we do have an a OpenSUSE 101 website that is 101.opensuse.org. Uh, I got it right. Hey, <laughs> um, that is that is, you know if you want to get linked wow, up that's with, like really green in here. That's with cool. mentors, with you know how to contribute to various projects, that's that's the place to do it. Um, and I absolutely recommend it. Uh, it is a very very cool, very welcoming, and very warm community. Um, so uh, there you have it. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, questions. Not my question. Relay. Really like question in the corner. Oh, oh. I'm just curious, what is the need for towing? So I I run Steam and everything else on my Tumbleweed distro right now. It's fantastic. What about like WoW or anything like that? Like World of Warcraft? Yeah. When, when will it play World of Warcraft for Windows under OpenSUSE Tumbleweed? Are you asking me? So last time I was on a conference call with Blizzard. Uh, <laughs> I don't freaking know. Last time I played World of Warcraft for the last time, like six or seven years ago, under Wine. I don't remember what distro I was even using at the time, but it played fine. I don't. I don't um, know. Caleb, can you? <laughs> I don't wave know, your wand? man. <laughs> can you wave your wand? So that's that's Caleb back there waving his wand. Um, He'll be at the OpenSUSE booth a lot, and he's just playing games on OpenSUSE all the time. Yeah. So he is our resident gaming expert. Yeah, yeah. Game, gaming on OpenSUSE isn't any more of a problem than gaming on Debian or gaming on Ubuntu or gaming on Fedora if you're really crazy. Uh, but actually, I think, I think Leap has made it a little better because of the NVIDIA drivers and the way that oh, they yeah. do the NVIDIA drivers. But I mean, even even so, I mean, it, it there are inherent issues, I mean, with gaming on Linux in the current day and age, but I think it's the same issues for all Linux distributions at yeah, this point. I would agree. It's not a very distribution specific. Yeah. We have, we have things to overcome. I mean, the, and, you know, when we're talking about, like, Wayland, there's other issues to overcome, but it's not like there's any one distro that's better or worse than others on that. Like, honestly, installing Steam, like, I mean, because most, uh, most people who play games use Steam, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it just is a, it's a, for better or worse, it just is. But most, you're going to get installed on OpenSUSE or Fedora or Ubuntu. It, it's going to run very comparably from what I've seen. You, man. I asked you this question on your AMA. Did I ignore you when you... <laughs> you answered me, but I think you're a little bit too new to answer the question. All right, give me the question. What do you got? At this point, we, we've come to a point with Tumbleweed where we're getting back a lot faster than ours. Yeah. And for whatever reason, everybody still seems to have some sort of weird love for Arch. What is it going to take, in your opinion, to switch those Arch people to Tumbleweed? <laughs> well, okay. So I don't want to begrudge anyone their distro of choice. Are Arch yeah. users in here? So Arch is fine, right? I mean, yeah. there's nothing like there's nothing I I don't dislike Arch at all. So I don't I don't want this. Just like I don't dislike Fedora at all. I dislike Fedora. I gotta Arch be honest. Cool, I dislike Ubuntu, but the rest of it's fine. So, so, but here's the thing, though, is that it's whenever somebody asks for Arch, they're asking for Arch Linux. Yeah. Well, they're they've been around the longest. There, it's it's there was a period of time. When, when you referred to Linux, you meant Red Hat. I mean, and it's not, it, for better or worse, I mean, SUSE has been around longer than Red Hat as a company, 
right? Um, Slackware existed longer than both. Um, but the reality is, it's, it's at any given moment, different distros have different market share in terms of like, I guess not market share, but mind share. So um, back in like the late 90s, you could go to a Circuit City or a Best Buy or Weber and see SUSE Linux and Red Hat Linux in boxes on store shelves. And you could find those two. And so for a time, it was kind of like when you thought Linux, you thought Red Hat and then a runner-up SUSE for that period of time. And then as time went on, that kind of went away. And so when you thought desktop Linux, you didn't think Red Hat Linux anymore or, or SUSE Linux because you didn't find those boxes on store shelves anymore. And the, the people that were pushing it the most for a good couple of years was Ubuntu. So then now all of a sudden, Ubuntu becomes the one you think of when you think of Linux. In the rolling release space, Arch has had almost no real competition for a long time. Nowadays, they absolutely do. And I would, I would posit that from a technical perspective, there are solutions to Arch that have more testing and are a little bit more stable and consistent. But for most people, they are comfortable with Arch. They're using Pac-Man. They know how to use Pac-Man. They like the fact that it's called Pac-Man. They like the fact that it's a little Pac-Man munching the dots when they install software, if they use the right flags. They like that. And so as long as it's working for them, they're not going to switch. Tumbleweed does meet all their needs. It totally does. Everyone here who's running Arch, if you switched over to Tumbleweed, you totally would be happy. Absolutely would. But unless there's a problem, they're not going to switch. So the next time Arch screws up real big and breaks Wayland and Xorg, yeah, we'll probably see yet another spike. Because <laughs> that's just how that works. I think Arch has a really interesting niche. Arch took over from Genty, basically. Yeah. Gentoo or Gentoo? Ooh, Gentoo, Gentoo, right? Yeah. Gentoo. Gentoo, yeah. Gentoo. Yeah. So, and they have this niche which is difficult for a Red Hat or a Fedora or a Suze to fill because they're, a, they are, it is a community distro and there are people who are attracted by that form of organization. The feeling that it's just a bunch of us, like, forum Like there's no nerds. supporters. There's no, there's no right. corporate. It's almost, I want to say leave, but that's a neat way hey, of it. But there's a certain organization that goes with Arch. And it's stuff like, I mean, I, I joke, I call the Arch Wiki is like the, uh, the, the Fedora second official documentation site. Right. Like that. It's, like every, it's like the Gentoo Wiki used to be. It's like everyone is directing people to the Arch Wiki all the time. And that. that's like a function of their community, right? So I think that's one thing Arch has that's difficult to get. Adam, other people have questions too. Sorry. Yeah, geez, Fedora, <laughs> stop talking. Uh, let's start over this side. Yeah. yeah, just to comment on that. Like, I've been looking at moving to a rolling release I've been running uh, Tumbleweed and Gentoo like, on different machines for almost a year now. And what I have found is that Tumbleweed breaks shit more often, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, and so I was actually thinking about this question. Like, I'm not thinking it's not great, right? No, it's fine. Uh, but I was thinking about this question. Oh, we got Leap, which is rock solid. We got Tumbleweed, which is like, you know, doing this, you know, great stuff. Yeah. Only release, but when I'm looking for a role in the least distribution, right, I'm looking for something where I don't have to constantly forklift upgrades every year or six months, in the worst case, dear Lord. Um, 30 <laughs> months. 30 months. Okay. <laughs> okay, but I, I, I don't, I don't think... Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you can... I don't think you can deliver packages at that rate with... Okay. Yeah. Doing, which is like this more heavily QA rolling release. It's right. You know, it, so it's, it's less. A, it's less heavily QA. So, like, I mean, a good it's a example. It's a little bit less dynamic than um, a rolling release. Right? really yes. It's a little less dynamic, and there is there is safety in that. So I, I totally get what you're saying. So, like with Arch, my favorite example right now is is like no, right? So Tumble, the new version of Gnome comes out. Was it uh, 3.24 comes out? Is that the right one? Yeah, that's the current one. And it, it's a good new release, right? Tumbleweed, boom, boom, <laughs> it's out. Got it right away. Like, we're talking, like, hours. It's just, it's out. It's great. Arch waited a month, month and a half, something like that. And it's not that Arch necessarily even put in a whole bunch of extra testing. It's just they waited a while. And there's logic to waiting a while, and there's logic to getting it out right away. It depends on what your particular needs are. Yeah. So, like, for me, like, a lot of what I do is reviewing latest and greatest software, right? So... I need something like Tumbleweed so that I can just install it and use the latest version of these sorts of things, and I can get in there, or the developers of the project can get in there and try it out right away. 
Um, and that's kind of where Tumbleweed ends up kind of shining. Arch, they don't really have that extra QA process, but they do tend to go a little bit slower. So they are rolling, but not as heavy. Like yeah, it's a slow roller. Tumbleweeds. Roll, it's more like the difference between uh, a race car and the Flintstones movie. <laughs> <laughs> both of them are driving and they're both going to get there so one of them is going slow you're not wearing any shoes and Barney rubbles in the car you know? <laughs> yes. yeah. just, just so you know in terms of Arch I think mean, part of that you know, delay is the you're not defending Arch are you? no I don't need to run but it's fine it's fine it's fine it's fine it's fine it's actually more of a gentle person but both Red and both Arch and Angelina have been testing um, a group of hospitals yes and part of that delay is the, the testing of hospitals first so all the people who want to go faster will do it there. Maybe that's not quite as fast as Tumbleweed a little bit, but faster than I don't think the whole month after that's what we know. No, normally it doesn't take that long. This was just a, an odd case. Yeah. Which yeah. one's the next one? Right here. I was just going to address your question. Uh, to make that <laughs> <laughs> uh, more attractive to Arch users, you'd have to get rid of the installer to make it a recipe, and you'd have to make your final product be text only. <laughs> and then you have to make it take a week to get where you want to be. Yeah, that would help. And really, it's a dumb question. Why do you need to make people go from one to another? Let them go to yeah, yeah. Well, they're all big companies. No, no, no. Players. My question wasn't making one go to the other. It was changing the perception. Oh, okay. You know, the Not perception that the is that yeah. the, the rolling release is arch. Yeah, you know, no, they, they, it's, it's, a brand, it's a branding issue. It's like yeah. Kleenex. So like, I, think, I, I, think, I just want to blow my nose. I don't technically need Kleenex right, brand right. things in my face, right? it's, <laughs> but I still say Kleenex. Right. I think we've got we're on the road there. And and to the question about tumbleweed, yeah, it's tumbleweed is largely an automated process and it moves really fast. And the the extent there are going to be lumps. Um, that being said, Richard Brown has a tradition of at the beginning of every conference he goes to updating his tumbleweed. Um, this is tumbleweed. This is what I work on every day. Yeah. As a developer developing on these tools, I'd rather deal with the lumps that are in the new version than have an old version that isn't what I'm actually developing against. Right. Um, so that's really that's awesome. where you got to live with. the The advantage there is that as we automate that cycle, we free up dev time to build more tests. And people are building tests, and the repository of tests is growing, and the test suite breadth is growing, and the depth is growing, and we're, you know, to the extent that other distros are writing tests too, that helps as well. There's kind of, there's going to be a critical line where the test coverage gets really good, and then it's a non-issue. Right. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's go him, then you. All right, I'm just uh, quick. Just on a different track. So I just went to 101.0.2.org, yeah. and I got a uh, certificate issue, so I just wanted to check. So there are, so uh, that, that might actually be a hosting thing right now. I know we're changing some, like, there's some DNS things that we're changing right now, and yeah. I don't know the status of that. So that might, that might be a legit issue. That, that would be at status.opensusa.org. Yeah, if you go to status.opensusa.org, you can see a status of all, like, the various services we have running and whatnot. That, that might actually be a real thing, because I know some things are moving right around yeah. yeah. It's a bad weekend for them to be moving. It's a bad us. weekend for them to be moving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So is there like a lightweight version of Tumbleweed so it doesn't come with all the free yeah, install in fact, software? Because that's been the, the problem. Net. The, the net install. Like you get all this crap yes. that I don't want. Oh, yeah. If you, get, yeah, if you grab the, the Tumbleweed like DVD version of the ISO, it's like 5.4 gigawatts of craziness. It's insane. <laughs> Giga. Uh, Giga. I was making up. So, <laughs> so yeah, get, get the net install, and then it's it's basically bare bones system, and then during the installer, you just choose what like, <coughs> templates you want to put on. That's what drove me to arm, yeah. the fact that I yeah. start off with minimal system and just added what That's, I wanted. The, the net installer the is on depending on the day between eighty and hundred megabytes, and um, and then you just need to pick and choose specifically yeah. what you want. Yeah, and the, so. if you go grab the installer for Tumbleweed, it's rebuilt all the time. So you're always getting the latest version of the installer and the kernel and everything else. It's not like dated. And so like um, there are there are drawbacks to that because you have less total packages on there. Like for example, I have a, a, this machine over here from it's a like little system seventy six laptop, but it ships with Ubuntu. I'm clearly not an Ubuntu guy, so I wanted to put OpenSUSE on it. If I do the OpenSUSE net install because it doesn't have everything else, it doesn't handle all of the possible hardware issues quite as well. So I ended up needing to go grab the DVD, which is that big Herc and ISO. But even then, in that installer, you can still tear it back. You 
take out yeah. some of those and okay. yep. yeah. yeah, and you can you know choose what your desktop environment is because OpenSUSE doesn't have a default thing. We don't have a default. We don't bless like one desktop environment and one huge set of applications. Like you know, we just we, we want to just work for a whole lot of different desktops and everything else. So you can just choose it and install that. Yes, Ubuntu guy. Going off of uh, what you were saying about desktop environments, can you run Unity on it? I don't know. Yeah. Ask Canonical. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. Does anyone want to load up something other than Ubuntu there, and there run Unity on it? There was a thing for a while, but I think it was around like Unity you know, 5 or 6. You know what you can do, though? You can run Pantheon from the elementary project oh, yeah. on OpenSUSE. It's, it's up sweet. on the Open Build service. I read it on one of my machines at home. There's a couple of like hiccups here and there, but I think mostly ironed out now. So, um, I mean, even the desktop environments that are built for other things, people in the OpenSUSE world go, hey, I want to run that on my thing. Even if I don't actually want to run it on my thing, I just I want to be able to. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we find with package. package for some yeah, you can try. Well, Unity wasn't developed for other platforms. Yeah, it, it, wasn't really it was. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't meant to be. Well, that's it. it, it tried. It's, it's yeah. to the extent that Unity would be available, it would depend specifically on the community to do that, to scratch their own itch with it. If someone wants nobody it, nobody who is a SUSE engineer would be doing that. Um, because of the legal requirements with Canonical. Like right. we, yeah, it, our the lawyers and their lawyers so. cannot make that work. Right. We, we have are like, not going to sign a community guys license that have, agreement that have for that. Canonical license agreements, and they're in like a, they have like virtual machines <laughs> that they can use yeah. to do that work. Yeah. So that would have to be done. And for the community in general, they're already scratching their own itch with something else. If, I mean, if a guy really wants to run U Unity that bad, then I guess he's running an old version of Ubuntu from here on in. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean that, that, is, that is the reality. It, it is. It's very, very much those who want to do it make the decisions on where the distro goes. Like, like I was complaining at one point, because I use terminal a lot, right? I, I don't use a GUI all that often. I just sit in my terminal all the time. And there are some terminal tools that aren't necessarily packaged currently for Ubuntu, ones that most people don't really use, like I have my terminal-based word processor and everything else. Um, so I was complaining about it. And Richard Brown, our chairman, just kind of looked at me, and he's like, so friggin' package it. And I'm like, oh, I guess that's a good point. And then I'm like, man, wouldn't it be cool if we had, like, a custom, like, version of OpenSUSE that was just meant for people like me, where it was, like, the world's best terminal distro, like, with all the cool stuff installed, with cool, like, terminal menus and everything. He's like, so do it, and then we'll just put it up on OpenSUSE.org. Whoever decides to do something... They decide to do something. No one's going to tell them no unless it creates some sort of huge, like, legal problem. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I, I do have kind of a practical one. Uh, uh, I hope this one is kind of mine, but I think for uh, other people. Yeah, lay it on me, man. Um, yeah, you know, let's, let's assume you need to leave or you want to. Some, some some reason, and then uh, and at some point you want to upgrade your hardware too, right? Because you cannot, you know, buy a new hardware every year or so. Sure. And then the deep release cycle is kind of behind, right? So so right now, if you use Leap, uh, you can really use the world of CPU reliably. It doesn't. It sucks on Skylake and and doesn't run from Kabylite. Is there any, any thought beyond synchronizing the leaf kernel releases to the hardware releases? So because you, had, you know, it, it's a problem. Right? Yeah, I, I yes. see what you're saying. Um, so hardware support, um, the kernel for leaf is coming from SLES, from SUSE Linux Enterprise. Um, we have an obligation there to our customers to guarantee ABI compatibility for the whole line. So SLES 12 SLES 12 SP1, SLES 12 SP2, SLES 12 SP3, through whatever, will be binary compatible with whatever you put on top of it. Um, and that means for Leap, 42.1, 40, well, not 42.1, 42.1 yeah. list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 42.2 forward will be binary compatible with whatever you put on top of it. So how do we do new hardware? Every service pack, we go through a ton of feature requests and support, and we backport patches for new hardware support into the older kernel, so we can support new hardware and new tools and get bug fixes in, but maintain the binary compatibility of the kernel. So you're only going to see that when there's a new version. 
42.3 will, I guarantee, solve your problems for that. I, I understand but, that. But, but, please but yeah, there's going to be a gap. They are too hard to behind. Yeah. And, and, anyway, look, I'm just, yeah. I'm just bringing it up. No, no, no. I can't get alarmed. No, I totally get it. And yeah. that's the challenge. Yeah. The it's other the option challenge. is Tumbleweed, which is running 4.11. whatever the hell you, it is you today. You can't use Tumbleweed in Enterprise because you get no. third parties of there. It's just right. no way back on our Tumbleweed. Right. right. I, I agree. I agree. I, if, you're, if you're running Enterprise, you go, you go Leap. And then when Leap comes out, uh, you should have good hardware support at that moment. Uh, but it is, you know, if new hardware comes out after that point, same uh, applies to it. To Slack, you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's the same thing. You know, yep. Yeah, it's a little more, a little more enterprisey. Yeah. yeah, there's pluses and minuses. Yeah, but if you're running on latest and greatest for your like your workstation or something like that, then tumbleweed, tumbleweed, and then no, lockdown. No, no, no. You know, everybody has three, three, three part, part, part of the They want really yep. tumbleweed. <laughs> I'm with and, you. And that basically means that you can't buy. Anyway, you got hardware. You you got lots of that. That that yeah. said, um, I I test a lot of hardware for a living, including like uh, this, which is a, a KB Lake laptop and whatnot. Leap runs delightfully well on all of it. Um, so I've never actually encountered issues like that, but I am absolutely positive that some do exist, um, just because of the. Okay, so yeah, I'm very yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an I mean, it's something that we constantly work on. So because it has to be constantly worked on. And we are the SUSE management team is working really aggressively to tighten that down. Um, the release cycles for service packs are pretty hard now at 12 months. So and new versions come out pretty more pretty frequently than they used to. Much more frequently than so. they used to. Yeah. Let's do. Yeah. Let's do one one final question, be, and then we can let people eat food. Yes, sir. Um, so you mentioned the community. Where does the communication exist uh, when somebody when somebody joins us? Is this some sort of how do you, how do you want to communicate? Yeah. Okay. So you could go to lists.opensusa.org, okay. where we have all of our mailing lists, and there's the like lists 150 good. mailing lists it, for there's, so there's, there every is, there's niche a, product. There's a ton of mailing lists. lists. Um, um, uh, the general project OpenSUSE mailing list is a good one, just because it gets you a lot of stuff. Um, but there's a, there's a bunch of other ones as well. OpenSUSE on Freenode. Yeah, and IRC. OpenSUSE because Gnome we're and OpenSUSE KDE and OpenSUSE of whatever the hell you want to do on Freenode. Uh, yeah. There is no Slack. There probably will never be an OpenSUSE Slack unless you start one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, is. and then yeah. cool, we'll list it. Um, I but, probably yeah. won't use it though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Email and IRC are mostly. Email and IRC. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah. Or find us when we're at conferences and pester us. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that works too. It's like fast or slow. Yeah, right? Yeah. All right, everybody, go have some lunch. I don't know, are they doing lunch over across the thing today? Yeah. All right, go have some lunch. Enjoy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.